Can Innovate podcast, where we highlight the Canadian innovators who are changing the game. I'm Septa Malhotra, your proud Canadian host. Today on episode two, we're actually featuring both of the co-founders from Elastic Thinking, Eve Legoff and Jake Phillips. So they're going to show us and learn how they are applying anti-consulting principles, how they've launched CTO as a service to create a benefits realization in months and sometimes even in days, and how they're on an admission to help their clients eliminate technology waste. I've actually known Eve for many, many years, who has uh, extensive international experience with large corporations in the IT tech world. After many years in the big corp world, Eve decided to jump feet first in the startup scene. And now Eve is taking it even one next step further into really connecting the right people at the right time from whether you're a senior executive to a tester to architect, and he just makes everything really simple. Uh, and then we also have uh, Jake Phillips, who has been in the startup and consulting world for over a decade. And that is definitely an established expert in software architecture, design, execution. The one thing I love about Jake is that he has a real great ability to be able to bridge the gap between business and technology, which has definitely sets him apart from a lot of other people and spurred him co-found Elastic Thinking with Eve, basically a company that's founded on anti-consulting principles. So Eve and Jake have paired up and they have the same vision of disrupting the big consulting business model. Welcome, Eve and Jake. Did I miss anything in your intro? No, sounds good to me. Thank you for having us. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for having us, that, man. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Let's get us started. You know, how did you guys come up with the idea about Elastic Thinking? Eve, did you want to take that? Sure. I think uh, your intro was good, and uh, it's a good segue to, to to for me to expand a little bit. Right after about I don't know a decade plus of being bailed out at lawyer rates, so you know the average rate I think in Canada is three sixty, and I the last, one of the rates I saw when I was at a, at a company that did network equipment provision was in the four hundred range, and that's okay. There's nothing terribly wrong with that, but what I found grading after a few years was the disorganized cast of thousands and and I I literally mean more than thousands I mean some companies have 10,000 developers and 20,000 staff and you've been in projects with 100 200 people and it's inevitable there'd be disorganization so part of that disorganization is that there's a lot of overhead so if there's one thing that made a difference is that people that really know what they're talking about are few and far between namely tr- true experts if they're brought under the right circumstances if they're corralled they can be 10 times more effective. And so um, when I was talking about overhead, I'm thinking about HR, I'm thinking about recruiters. Uh, it, it's just not something you can just wade into. So uh, and particularly when it comes to that, what you were mentioning earlier, the that hybrid skill of technical and management uh, abilities, uh, also related to the ability to be full of breadth and depth. So a lot of people talk about it, but not a lot of people do it. And so to be, to be a bit more concrete, I'm thinking about the process to sell pre-sales to solution architecture to detailed design delivery and and ultimately being close to executives who are more times than not very talented but are not close enough to the metal after all of this i just decided that it's just better to uh focus this i think jake and i were on the same page that we can't really just walk into a a 20,000 person company and argue with them but when it came to small medium businesses and startups we thought, well, here we really can help because there's a, a gap uh, that uh, some struggle with. So on this topic of bridging gaps, uh, that was our core focus. Gaps between business and technology, between planning and execution, sales and delivery, and everywhere where it takes a certain type of expert solution on the spot to solve tricky problems. Because I've seen it more often than not that the problems go unnoticed and, and they just kind of snowball. So over both of our careers, we've met a good number of people like this, and we turn to solve these problems into uh, expertise problems for our solutions. So it's kind of like our bag of tricks or arrow quivers. Uh, so we approach clients with a kind of a, with a, me- a medical diagnostic uh, metaphor, so to speak, where we start asking questions. And this is nothing terribly new, but instead of having a lot of paper generated, we try and make it short, concise conversations with senior people and focus on what needs to happen in, in the coming days, not some kind of grand vision. We, we do the grand vision, but we really are keen on getting uh, virtually immediate results. Almost at the end of the meeting, I, I can think of one customer where we said, here's a few things you might want to look at. And this is during the pre-sale cycle. And they came back and said, well, you know, we've already implemented that. That's very good. We said, well, good. That's a bit of sugar. Now, let's expand this a little bit. 
we can get you out of emergency care, but you're still not really, you're convalescing right now. So if you want to really take it to the next level and, and, and perform beyond your abilities, which you thought your abilities were limited, well, they're not. And so we worked that into the, into the process. It has to be seen in the context of the market. So we're very cognizant of the need to understand the circumstances in which the customer is not, and keep it current. Uh, and also the circumstances they may not be aware of. I think that's about it. Uh, off the ground, networking, talking to VCs are some of the uh, the key points that matter to us. The caveat is that there are limitations because to come, some degree, there are. this is relatively new. Uh, we've met with a couple of uh, VCs who said, you know what, you're, you're not new, but you're very rare. I've seen some experts in the legal field do this. I've heard of somebody in, Canada, in Toronto doing this uh, who opened up uh, her uh, law, law practice at the Upper Canada Law Society Library, and instead of billing the, the four hundred thousand dollars an hour uh, at a McCarthy, she just said, "No, uh, I'll, I'll bill at one hundred and five, uh, and you can come to the, the library." And guess what? A, a lot of customers just said, "Fantastic!" And, and she's rolling now, and that's about it. No, that's amazing. That's great because both of you guys come from both large corporations and the startup scene, so you know that. Each company, depending on where they are in the life cycle, has different types of priorities and where they're trying to focus on, whether they're trying to get to the minimum viable product versus, you know, really trying to do a huge, large scale transformation of some sort. I love that seeing, you know, a bit of sugar. So how, so you're helping your clients save money and make money. So, you know, this is something that big consulting firms also claim that they do as well. I mean, the, the, the jobs that, that we work on by design are, are they're bite size in their, their orientation, right? So uh, instead of the, the, the big consulting speak where it's, uh, okay, you know, put six figures on the table, we're going to send in a team of 10 people to bill $1,000 an hour uh, for a minimum of uh, months. We're looking at adding value immediately through, you know, as, as he was, was talking about the, that, that diagnostic analogy as, as well as those, those quick wins that are typically done within days. Because most, most companies that, 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 that are in the space that are, that are looking for this, this type of help have immediate needs. And they also have an inkling that they're not really doing their strategy uh, entirely correct. So it's, a, it's kind of a, approaching it from bottom up and top down at the same time. So we're really looking at, you know, benefit realization within, you know, days, weeks, and months, not in the kind of in the years. But one thing that should be said that the the bar to entry, you already said it, but I just want to elaborate a bit. Yeah. I've not seen, and I'll name names here, we need to edit them out later, but in the engagements I've been with Accenture and PwC, and just to name a couple, uh, when I, I think of A.T. Kearney as well as another example. Th they really do not entertain anybody uh, for less than, I don't know, like 10,000 would be surprising. 100,000 seems like the low bar, but they really do expect uh, $10, $20 million out of these deals, right? So that market is not our market, and I think that's kind of important to understand as well. We're going after small, medium businesses, and there's no way Accenture would touch them. Mm -hmm. No, it's so true. They are small, medium sized businesses are such an underserved market. Exactly. And, and Jake, I really like your, your point about, you know, years has become months, right? And months have actually become days. And you guys being able to prioritize them with those quick wins, I think that is such a huge value, especially wherever they are um, trying to achieve. Um, so I think that's, that's great. I really love this whole disrupting the consulting model. Right. It's, it's really all about, you know, small and medium sized companies um, have advantages over the, their, their larger counterparts because they can be more more agile and more nimble. So it, it's all about accenting that that ability uh, and being more effective with less. Uh, and they can get away with that. And that's that's really what makes that attractive. Now, if they have the tools to take that to the next level, all of, all of a sudden they're playing at a disruption game uh, when it comes to those larger companies. And, you know, if they're talking about growth, they're talking about exit strategies, all of that comes on the table a little bit sooner and a little bit more attractive. Amazing. Going into this a little bit more deep, has there been like a lot of any big aha moments that you've seen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me let, let me take this one. So the, um, I, I, I would say the, the, the biggest aha, you know, I, I think that we've had is, you know, when dealing with um, our CTO as a service uh, offering. So those are this is a service that is geared towards kind of the, the board level and the executive level at non-technology companies in the small medium-sized business. So these are companies that, you know, these are not internet companies. Uh, these are not even technology forward companies necessarily. They, you know, they're 
doing something else. Um, but obviously, in the in the world that we live in, technology is a cornerstone to everything we do. It is you know kind of ubiquitous everywhere. Um, but there's a there's a culture out there that really kind of uh, silently ignores technology. If it works, it's fine. We will just not touch it. Um, instead of trying to be uh, technology forward, and you leave, you kind of get yourself into this catch twenty two where you know you should be doing better. You know you should be paying attention to it, but it's not your strong suit, so you don't. And you just kind of keep kicking that can down the road because it's not your your strong suit. And then you get yourself into this kind of situation, if you will, that you're kind of afraid of looking a little, frankly, stupid in front of your colleagues uh, and potentially board members. You read the magazines a little bit, you learn some buzzwords, but there's no there's no actual depth behind it. There's a lot of talk, but not a lot of actual action. And it's funny that, you know, in, in offering those services to them, and, you know, with the CTO as a service product, where we basically come in and say, listen, technology is not your strong suit. And that's fine because you're not running a technology company, but you need to you need to focus on this stuff. So it can either accelerate you or at minimum get out of your way um, so that you can grow your company. Realistically, these companies are not going to be able to hire, uh, I mean, top tier CTOs, obviously not, uh, or even kind of your you know, lower level CTOs, because frankly, there's just not enough work for them um, and enough work for them at the C-suite level. Um, so getting kind of a, a grade A CTO is not something that's really in their grasp. So when you kind of balance that between them and you say, well, if it's, it's kind of almost a, a, a psychiatrist moment that really has to happen where it's a, you know, they have to kind of admit they have a problem before they want to solve it. And that's kind of the that that's the big aha moment that's it's really come down to it. You know, playing uh, playing a bit of psychiatry with you know CEOs and you know owners, uh, you know, CFOs and, and all the rest of it has been an interesting interesting challenge. But it's it's been an interesting uh, kind of eye opener for us as, as you know as our, our services have uh, have evolved and, and and really gotten traction. And then you know it, it once you get in the door. The, the next surprising thing, and I think this comes from us being in kind of technology companies or technology forward companies, um, you know, in our past, but just how much technology waste there is uh, and how many vendors are so predatory and literally prey on these types of companies. They sell them things they don't need. They claim that things are integrated when they're not. I could I could go on forever, you know, listing things. I think we've all kind of had that experience where You've got that predatory vendor that either sells you the moon and then under delivers or, you know, literally just will lie to you uh, to, to get business and then lock you into long term contracts. So we're there to kind of break that model and, and let them know that, you know, technology doesn't need to be difficult. It doesn't need to be expensive. It needs to accelerate your growth. It needs to kind of get out of your way so that you can do uh, do your core uh, your core mission. And uh, at times, you you know, you need to be aware of where disruption and things like that are coming through. I mean, you can kind of read this on TechCrunch and, um, you know, all over the, the blog space and be like such and such, you know, place is going to get disrupted by this, going to get disrupted by that. Being prepared for that and pivoting at the right point from a technology perspective, but also from a non-technology perspective and having the two of those integrate together is critically important for especially the medium sized businesses these days, you know, as they're as they're looking to, you know, continue climbing that ladder. No, that's amazing. I really love that you put yourself in your customer's shoes. I mean, empathy is so key. And then it really would help them. I love the idea about that technology waste, because you're right, I didn't even actually even think about that concept before. There is a lot of those functionalities that are, you know, we implement that we don't actually utilize and so on. And I think that's a really interesting concept. So yes, I really like that. Aha. Yeah, and it's it's, it's funny that we, we we actually see that in you know very young startups as well. Again, non you know non technology type companies. Uh, you know sometimes service based you know industries that are that are easier to kind of you know start up as sole proprietorships or as kind of just get off off the ground. So it's funny one of the, one of the other services that that we that we offer is kind of the you know the the startup package if you will. So it's a uh, okay you know it's like a okay you're starting a company. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure you could Google around and figure out how to incorporate and, and things like that. But there's a whole list of other things that you need to kind of accomplish. And yes, you know, like a lot of people do figure this out. But again, it, they, they find the first thing that kind of works for them and they run with it, not knowing that they may be able to save, you know, a couple dollars here, a hundred dollars there, which at, at that kind of startup, especially when it's self-funded, you know, you're kind of doing a little bit of sweat equity and you're kind of getting up off the ground. You know, every dollar counts. And especially monthly 
the recurring dollars because you know that eats that eats into profitability, but it also eats into your bottom line and how much money you need to kind of either put into that or go out and raise. So elastic thinking, I really like how you're thinking. <laughs> has there been something that has been kind of your favorite entrepreneurial moment? That- Let me try to uh, take a, a stab at that. It, it comes back to what we do. We we, we keep on refining our, our services. And, and Jake made a point about that earlier. CTO as a service is one service where we do the all-encompassing roadmap, just like a uh, big uh, five consulting would do. But we're able to tailor it very quickly. But if that doesn't really appeal, we can say, well, look, let's turn the tables on the, on the problem and start with something that has immediate value. Like, I don't know, you cannot upgrade your platform or you're stuck with a platform. Here's an alternative. This is what it will take in terms of concrete steps that you can do, Mr. Customer, and that we can do. And, and so we separate the concerns so that the customer says, my God, this is all very concrete. I guess that's, uh, that's just a couple of examples. The, uh, the startup service is another one. So I guess what I'm trying to get at, there's a the reiterative recursive happening where we go in, see a problem, say, you know what, we can break that down into a, into a service. And then to the point about the startup service for people that are, say, dealing with uh, children with special needs, that's their, 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 uh, their wheelhouse. They've got a master's or a PhD, social workers, wh- whatever. We can say, look, here's your website. Here's your incorporation. Here's your trademark. Here's your, uh, your accounting. And that gets spun up in a matter of days. And for them, it looked like something like Mount Everest. And suddenly they can get back to the real work of doing their, uh, their, their practice or, or whatever they do as, uh, as a full-time job, not technology or, or uh, details around uh, contracts, like statements of work. Really about lowering the barriers to entry. I mean, yeah. that's, 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 that's really one of those, those key parts. But it, it's funny, when, you're coming, when we've been coming up with these, uh, these solutions, you know, when we come across problems that, that we've seen before, small company, big company in our, in our past, it becomes kind of the, the the tables end up getting turned on you as an entrepreneur, whereas, uh, you know, before you used to kind of go out, have a beer with your colleagues and kind of complain about, oh, you know, you know Dave is doing this again and, you know, the project is messed up. And well, now it's your problem to to, to fix it. And it's 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 interesting to have those those tables turned because, A, the freedom is amazing to be able to say, well, there are no limits uh, behind, you know, beyond like literally the law. And that's about it. So there's there's a lot of freedom there, but then there, there's also that kind of you know that responsibility that ends up being uh, you know kind of put on your shoulders to say, well, it's also your problem now. So let's go yeah. ahead and fix it. One of the things that we keep on reinforcing is that uh, trusted advisor. But on the other hand, if it actually can be done, it's incredibly valuable because the 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 trust and, and the empathy that that's not an overnight thing. It does take time, but if you actually deliver rapidly and and you actually are uh, embedded with a customer and, and you sit down, when I say the customer, I don't just mean the CEO or, or the, um, the CFO, or the, but I also mean the guy doing ops. I think that's a really key point is about, you know, but you're able to navigate faster to solve these client issues and problems, uh, probably more faster independently than a large corporation. When you guys were setting up, you know, Elastic Thinking, were you able to leverage any of the government tools or other types of groups? Or is there anything that you kind of wish that you had when you were starting up? And no, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. It's, so it, it's funny that a lot of the, you know, the, at least the, the government assistant stuff, is in programs that are out there, they're really geared towards product companies. So if you're running a service-based company, there's not a ton of grants that are going to, you know, show up at your doorstep. There's not even, you know, shred and all the rest of it. It's, it's very kind of research and, uh, and development. So product-based that's out there. Realistically, as an expert-based, you know, service, you kind of roll your own or, or you die. So it's, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's about one of those, um, you know, you need to really focus on how you differentiate yourself, what are your core values, and uh, and, and really focus on it. And I, I know that sounds a little fluffy, like oh, you know, the mission statement again. But honestly, it's it's one of those things that a lot of a, a lot of people don't do, or they do it kind of too late. Um, it's it's kind of a you know one of those exercises of you know who do you want to be when you grow up. And, and again, it, it sounds you know almost childish, but it's actually a really hard thing to do. Uh, and actually defining that and you know, forcing yourself to go through that. I mean, it gets easier every time, you know, you do it. And it's something you kind of need to checkpoint with yourself regularly, especially in the early days. Uh, but it does get easier. But from the, you know, from the, the aspect of you know, what tools and things we, we, we had, frankly, there, there wasn't a, there's not a lot of government stuff out there. Uh, realistically, it's network, 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 meet as many people as you can, realize that 
your, you know, the circles that you think are really large are actually probably really small. I mean, especially, you know, here in, in Toronto, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm going to be controversial in saying that, you know, the, the technology world here is really incestuous. You know, there's all, you're going to see a lot of the same places again and again. Uh, and I'd be highly surprised you know, to, you know, I, you know, I know for a fact that in the U.S. it's pretty much the same. Uh, the East Coast, you know, so it's New York and uh, in Silicon Valley, really. Um, there's a few other hubs, but again, you see the same faces again and again. And you see the same faces that are doing a great job again and again, but potentially in different uh, different places. Um, so, you know, there's 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 not a ton of resources that are out there for service-based companies. I love to see kind of a push there, but frankly, it, it's going to be a little difficult for government to really step in there. Uh, because, you know, service-based companies, there's not a ton of stuff that's really concrete. And frankly, you don't need a ton of startup capital to start a service-based company. I mean, you should be looking at, at clients and, 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 you know, having capital in uh, fairly, fairly quickly. So maybe that's why. Maybe I answered my own question. <laughs> no, but it's all, you also answered the next question. I was going to say, you know, what's some advice you'd give to those aspiring uh, Canadian innovators? And I, one of the big pieces I just heard from yours is like about networking. That That's so key to, you know, building those relationships and connections and everything else. Is there other types of advice that you might want to give out there to those guys that want to start something? Sure. Let me let me start, and then uh, Eve, uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll toss it over to you because I'm sure that you have some uh, some opinions on it. So, yeah, uh, honestly, you know, to, to start off, it's it's really about you know kind of what I was I was alluding to before. Uh, I mean, we're both service based, you know, kind of people. We've we've done work in, in the products, you know, sectors and things like that. But uh, honestly, it's it's one of those things where. Uh, the Canadian culture is, is, is pretty conservative. Um, so uh, you've heard this before, and I'll say it again, take risks. Um, but take risks. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will, you know, focus on small company, small companies with, okay, you know, I'm going to take a risk, I'm going to, you know, quit my day job, I'm going to do this whole thing. But now I need to go out and, you know, find some VCs to, to fund me and all the rest of it. Don't don't sweat the venture money. Um, honestly, it's one of those things where the VC market here again is conservative because that's the kind of the Canadian culture. Uh, it especially, I mean, I'm comparing this to the Silicon Valley where they shoot. It's not even from the hip. I don't even know where they're shooting from sometimes. They're a little bit more crazy. A lot more money flowing around and a lot bigger risks that are there happening. But that kind of gives us a bit of an advantage in that um, you know Canadian VCs want to see this this perfect package before they fund. So, you know, they, they want to see um, that you've got this explosive product. They want to see that there's growth already happening, that you're you know, already, um, you know, in the black from a revenue perspective, revenue is growing, which, frankly, if you have all those things, you probably don't even need VCs. Uh, you've got everything together already. So it's kind of one of those, like, stop assuming that you need kind of venture capital as part of your innovation cycle. Think about venture capital as accelerants only, not a make or break. If you're looking at, at, at venture capital as make or break, really, you know, kind of come back to what I was saying before. Really look again at your core values, what's your differentiators, and you know, make sure that you're you're approaching this in the right way. Because um, it's it, it really realistically these days you got to focus on on you know early revenue um, and kind of that that magical balancing game of listening to your customers but also educating them on, on what the new world is going to look like. And that once you figure out that balance inside of your market, um, between that and a little bit of revenue, VCs will come to you. It makes all of those conversations a hell of a lot easier uh, because you know all the answers because you had to do them yourself. So creating all those pitch decks and everything ends up becoming a lot more simple. And because you have the numbers to back you up, and like I said, the, the VCs will almost come find you. So, Eve, I'm, I'm sure you got something, you know, on, on on top of that. I'm sure you're kind of salivating to <laughs> to jump. So let me let me get out of your way here. No, no, it's all right. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because there's a bit of a segue to the earlier question uh, about uh, you know the, the government uh, innovation hubs and all that. It's a related question, interestingly enough, in the sense that so the government. Let me just kind of blend two questions at the same time because while I agree that with everything Jake said, obviously. You can you'll get some help from the government. It, like this is going to sound a bit naive, but I've been really pleasantly surprised by how a little bit of elbow grease on the the uh, ICGC website will get you very far. Uh, the, I have to take my hat off because they have really improved their. You, if you want to talk to them, they will talk. They will call you back, and it'll be a very easy conversation. But it, all it is is that 
they will expect you to, and this is the segue, they will expect you to have done a bunch of homework first. So it, it does really come back to you uh, as the, being accountable to yourself and, and to your partner and to your customers. So just a, a little bit of a nod to, to the government. As for innovation and startups, and tied to you know what would I tell the Canadian innovators? Don't completely ignore them, but really take it with a grain of salt. I mean, I, I know the, the scene when Jake said the the Toronto scene is incestuous. It, it really is, and frankly, I think all tech scenes are incestuous. Like I spent a bit of time in Silicon Valley. You, you get to know people really quickly. It's it. I mean, I'm not saying I rub shoulders with uh, Larry Page or anything, but. It's surprising how, how everybody knows each other, and I could go on about how, and Satma, you know this from how London, on, on the east side there, Shoreditch and, and whatnot, there's there's a bit of a hub scene going on. Paris, the same thing on the east northeastern side. The government there is helping a lot. The, on the on the innovation startup side, what, what I'm getting at, and I'll name names which may, ne- may need to be edited, but I know the guys that are at Mars. I know the guys that are at, uh, what is it called, 111, and they're good people. But I also know what they're doing with these people. And I would say for a young person, go with it. Have some fun with it, but don't expect too much. Uh, It'll be good for one reason, networking. And that's what I think really matters. Uh, You have to believe in yourself. Spend the time in school. Get your graduate degree. That's fine. I went to the Women's in Digital, and there's a very smart lady who said, you know, I'm thinking of getting a master's in finance. And uh, a venture capital guy was there, and he said, nothing wrong with that, but remember, you have to do it on your own. And maybe that MBA is good, but don't expect that to be enough. It's not a, a ticket to, to get in. It's just, a, if you will, like the, the key to the first door, but then you'll have a few more other uh, doors that well, you'll not have a key, but you'll have to hack through it. So putting the metaphors aside, the corporate scene is, is a bit like that too. It's, uh, it's a bit like government. You know, a good, as good an incubator as, as, uh, as going to uh, a hub. So I wouldn't knock that either. <clears throat> spend some time in startups. But at one point, if, if I had to, to do it all over again, I would spend less time uh, in, in the corporate world, in the, in the school world, uh, say a decade, max. At, at that point, you start hitting your early 30s. It, it's time to really, quote, Jake, to grow up and, and, and figure out what you can do with the rest of your life. And throughout the, the process from uh, from high school, literally, up until, uh, I would imagine, the, the late days of your, your, your career, Keep networking. And it's just like sales. Uh, I'm not a salesperson, but God knows I've spent a lot of time with salespeople and doing pre-sales. You just get used to, uh, to, to not really bagging the elephant, as the saying goes. But you keep going because you know it's going to work. You, you have to. Th- that would be the, the key ingredient. You'll be, this is where it gets fun. You'll be really pleasantly surprised because you will find supporters. You will find opportunities. You will find yourself to be, like, like that expression, the circle's not as big as you think. The mountains are not as that large. Once you get there, you say, hey, let's just keep going. One last thing I would say, uh, don't be naive. Uh, when you get into your own business, you'll find some unsavory types. And, you know, Bachman from Silicon Valley comes to mind, but that's the tip of the iceberg. It, it, there are some, some fraudsters out there. So uh, just, uh, just watch that. And last point, um, the, the overbuilding, overfunding, uh, I've lived through it. And it's, uh, it's really uh, not fun uh, because you find yourself – in one startup, I, was, I remember the CEO saying, we have to burn through the money. That's our job. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to make money? Are we supposed to build a product? Don't we have some, some concrete deliverables as part of a business plan? Uh, no, not really. Now that we've got the money, we just got to burn through it so we can get more money. And, and that I found completely disheartening. It, it's not, it didn't really resonate with me. And I would recommend that you, know, you, you stay true to yourself and stay true to what you had in mind. And if somebody tells you, no, no, we just got to go through the process and it's just another day job. Well, just just leave. You're smart enough. You got your contacts. Yeah, you know, don't be reckless, but but don't waste time. No, that's great advice. I mean, do your due diligence. I mean, whether you are experimenting and testing to see if you can focus on getting that early revenue, so you don't need the VC, but networking and learning and being able to share with other people. I, th- I think these are really uh, important things for anyone to kind of understand, and these examples are really great. So, not to interrupt, but I had just had an afterthought because. It comes back to confidence, really, uh, and, and connections. And uh, one thing that, and, and then hard cold cash. And one thing to remember is that the, the market you're in as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, you're going to be respected right away. So you're not talking $10 an hour here. <laughs> so remember that you, you, you'll be worth at least 100 or somewhere in that range. So 
I know it's not necessarily huge money, but it's more than enough. So, so try also to, this is some advice that a mentor gave me and I've, it's always stayed very close to my heart. You could go and get your job as, I don't know, a project manager or a solution architect and make, I don't know, a hundred thousand a year or something like that, 120. So what, how about if you just say, you know what, I could probably get by with say 60. Well, go with the 60. That's important. So say you make a hundred bucks an hour, put 50 bucks an hour for, for your, your rent and groceries, put the other 50 for your business. So staying lean is terribly important as well. But understanding that you are worth a lot and you're, you, you can play with the big boys so, and, and big girls. So maybe that needs to be edited a bit, but I, I feel strongly about that to, to, to remember what you're worth. No, that's great. And that kind of goes back to the next thing about if there's any of those key business philosophies or favorite quotes that kind of help you stay focused, you know, those kind of eureka moments. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually, this is a, it's a pretty good segue from, from where, you know, you was, was talking before. So I'll, I'll hone in on kind of the, the, the core values that have, have really kind of uh, structured uh, both myself and, and, and Eve. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where everybody's going to have, you know, a different definition of these core values. So it's not, you know, just, you know, take three of them and adopt them all, all the, on your own, but um, just, okay, just jumping right in. Uh, and this is, you know, the first one is, is, is easy. It's, you know, honesty, even when it hurts. And this is something that uh, big corporations are absolutely terrible about. Mm. Nobody wants to rock the boat. Nobody will discuss the elephant in the room. Um, and it's, you know, being the person that is literally, you know, be, being honest, being honest about why you're there, being honest about, uh, what your problems are and being honest about, you know, how you can do, do better at, at addressing them. It, it, it sounds, again, it sounds like almost HR speak, but it, it's actually really hard to do because, you know, you have to have that courage to stand up in the meeting and say, are we going to talk about how we don't have a plan to address the client's problem and kind of wave the, you know, like someone has to wave that flag. Because everybody's, you know, hoping that somebody farther up the chain is going to do it. And it's, you know, if, if nobody's willing to take that kind of responsibility, take it on yourself. You know, that's that's where that's where your values end up showing through. People see that and people will recognize it. And you know what? That's going to set you apart. And doing that again and again, it gets easier and it gets easier. And then when you're on your own in your own your, your own entrepreneurial uh, venture, you're going to realize really quickly that if you want anybody to pay attention to you, you know, more than the first meeting, you got to be honest and you got to be honest and you got to mean it. And, you know, that kind of transitions into the, into the second kind of, you know, set of core values, really, you know, the business philosophies, transparency, 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 transparency. And, you know, this is, you know, something that Eve was kind of, you know, alluding to with his, his, his funding, a, um, you know, kind of experience uh, there. And I've seen this again, you know, uh, before as well, you know, it's nobody runs a hundred percent perfect, you know, fairy tale shop. So stop pretending that you do. Everybody has faults in their business. Everybody has faults in their personality. Um, and actually being open and talking about that with your customers, you know, it really builds that, that bond of trust. Trust is critically important, as, especially as a small company uh, doing business with, with larger, you know, larger entities. So it's, it, it really comes down to they, they've taken a risk. They've taken a risk by, by betting on, on the, not the sure thing that came from uh, you know, the large vendor, they bet on, on you, they need to be able to trust you. So when you, you know, you're going to, you're going to screw something up. It's, it's just kind of a, you know, you're a human being, it's going to happen. Just be upfront with it, have a plan to deal with it, even if that plan is to get a plan, but be transparent about what, what's going on. And when you build that level of trust, it allows you to come back to your client and say, well, you know, you need to admit that there's some problems on your end too. Let's be transparent with each other because you now you have that trust in between you and you can get your client to start it, you know, start admitting that, okay, well, maybe, you know, I wasn't as upfront and I wasn't as responsive as, as I said that we were going to be. Let's work this through together is, is, is the next step. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really just putting it out on the, on the table uh, and being honest about, you know, what's there so you can, so everybody can pick up and move forward. Integrity. It's it, it's all about say what you mean, mean what you say, and do it already. It's it's really that easy. If you say you're going to do something in a in a meeting, you better do it or have it done. Uh, and it's you know, if you quote a date, that's your date. You're responsible for that now. So actually, go ahead and get it done. And you know if if you screwed up and you quoted the wrong date, well, I'm going to come back to you know the transparency and honesty section uh, on how that's not going to happen again. So kind of the, you can see that the three are really, you know, woven together, but really what this, this, those three things do with a client. And as you demonstrate them again and again, you build this strong 
bond of trust. And, you know, just coming back to some of the some of the service offerings that we have. I mean, if you look at CTO as a service, that's a really big you know, role that requires trust and it requires ongoing trust. I mean, this is, you know, basically we're filling the, the seat of, uh, of a chief, you know, chief officer. Uh, and that requires, you know, executive level trust. And I'll be honest with you, most executives don't trust anyone because they've been burned so many times that it just, you know, they, that's just their, their go-to. They just, they started like level zero trust if such a thing existed. And then maybe you can kind of build it up from there. But you'll see people like that start to respond immediately when you st- when you start to be you know, honest, transparent, and show integrity. Because they'll they'll look at you as someone that can get stuff done. They'll look at you that when you you know when you actually say you're going to do something, you mean it. And when you say that no, that's not something we do, they trust you. But they'll ask your advice on where to go. So you end up filling that trusted advisor role, which is something that we pride ourselves on. Uh, and that we, you know, we, we like to fill, whether you're a startup company that we're helping you get up off the ground, whether you're, we're running kind of CTO as a service, you know, for you, uh, whether we're just providing experts to fill a, a current gap in your, uh, in your growth pattern. Um, you know, that's, it, it really comes down to building trust with your, with your clients. And I love that. And speaking of doing, is there a productivity tool that kind of helps you keep focused? Uh, as, as much as I have tried to get rid of my pen and paper multiple times and be super green and, and all the rest of it, it keeps coming back. <laughs> but honestly, I'll, I'll, first one, I got to give a shout out to a company right here in, in Toronto, Canada, uh, FreshBooks. We find that it would be absolutely fantastic uh, for managing all the you know finance and expenses and invoices and, and you know that kind of that level of accounting. Uh, with our clients, it's frankly they made it so easy. It's embarrassing, and it's they're a fantastic company. I believe they're still located up at Young and Eglinton. Yeah, that's that's been kind of a just a, a standard wheelhouse that you know we've been, been using for some time. I'm a avid u- user of Todoist. Uh, I put almost an inappropriate amount of, of things in my to do list. That's probably because you know I have a, I have an infinite home, so. Uh, if I don't put it in a to-do list, it might get lost in the mess. And then, you know, right after that, you know, take notes, take notes, take notes. So Evernote is obviously the at, at the top of my list there as well. I take all those things, search through it. And really, I mean, it's rough notes. E- frankly, even preparing for this podcast, it, it's all in Evernote. <laughs> it's all right there. My, my last one, which is really, it's my favorite. And, you know, it's when I was running execution teams for for larger companies, trying to Kind of do the do the impossible mission thing. I used to have a rule. It was you can always come and ask me any question, but if I can Google it and it's on the first page where you know the, the team drinks or you owe the team food, you know donuts, you know you, you better be making it up to the team because you know Google is 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 you know, part of that ubiquity of, of technology. Um, so it's obviously one of my you know my 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 go to tools. It's it's almost like you know my right arm uh, in that. You know, it's a, I expect that, you know, before we have a conversation, you've already Googled this and, you know, you need clarification on something or you need me to connect the dots or we've actually managed to find something so arcane that is actually not in Google, which does happen. Trust me, it's it's far and few between, but it does happen. No, it makes sense. And is there like a, a favorite book or podcast that you're currently uh, listening to to keep up to date with your knowledge? I'll, I'll start off and then Eva, I know you have a, a, a long list and some, some opinions on this. So, um, I think probably it was one of the first, you know, business books that, that, that I read. And frankly, I think it's still my favorite. Freakonomics is, is just fantastic. Um, and then, uh, good to great was, was, was also, was also really good as well. And cause it, it really kind of instilled some of the, the, the things that I was talking about with kind of that core values. Because, you know, the, the core values and the way that elastic thinking is approaching the market right now works um, in two, three, five, ten years, the world's going to look different. We're going to need to pivot. But the core values are going to remain the same. And that's, I mean, if I had to sum up good to great, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, and then lastly, uh, execution, uh, which is, it's it, it's a book about things that, frankly, I, I feel like they should almost be taught in high school, but it's, it's literally about how to get stuff done. Um, so when you're having a meeting, Take your own notes. Take the action of send your notes back out to the to the group to make sure that you actually are on point. Repeat yourself. You know, uh, when you come in, have an agenda for a meeting. Actually, follow your agenda and and get the the points taken care of. Follow up at the end to make sure everything's you know actually done. It is rigid, boring, fifty style meeting, but it's one of those things that frankly has gotten lost in you know everybody trying to be nimble and agile. 
they feel like the, they need to get rid of structure everywhere so that everybody can do kind of everything on the fly. So, I mean, that's that's been actually a, a, a big help for me. Eve, you know, remind me of the things that I, I forgot. I found that it was almost an industry unto itself. There, there are some exceptions, like, of course, uh, the Lean Startup by Eric Ries. That's, that's a solid one that has a methodological bent. Uh, another book, which is less of a business book, but it, it really, really influenced me, and it, it's, it's related to Lean. I'm interested in, in, uh, in cues and optimization, and the, the, the gentleman in, in question is Eliyahu Goldratt, He's an Israeli physicist who uh, started off as a physicist, obviously, but then uh, moved on to do some consulting for El Al. Uh, short story here, where uh, El Al had one uh, 747, oh, sorry, seven 747s, but only one hangar for the 747s. And guess what? That was the, the constraint. So it's called one of his, he's got a number of books, but basically it's from the theory of constraints. And, and that really, really got my attention because I read through the PNP stuff and uh, but none of it was concise to say uh, if you it, there's one premise is that it's a demand constraint so you've got too much demand if you don't have too much demand none of this applies to it so if you got a lot of people wanting a lot of stuff which typically happens uh, in any well not necessarily in, in business but in, in organizations where I need I need more I need more give me and a lot of people the last thing I need is somebody who needs something well Goldratt said look LL uh, let me go speak to the supervisor so he goes to the supervisor and the supervisor has a long list of a million things to do good. And he says, well, you know, you're the physicist, you figure it out. And Elia, who just grabs a piece of paper, tears the, the top five centimeters and gives it back to him and says, just do the first five things. Next thing you know, problem solved. So it's a bit of a, a, a apocryphal, apocryphal story, but that, that one influenced me a lot. Um, the last thing I would say is that for the past few years now, I find that audio is really, uh, it's kind of like Jake was saying about Google. Uh, it's it's a, it's a good tool, but if you if you've been using Google for say twenty years, you'll see that it's just gotten better and better and better in terms of sensitivity to uh, to, uh, to to search results. And I find audio is like that for the past three four years. Take the Economist for example. That's a I, t I got the audio weekly. I find that to be useful not not only to just run my business, but when I approach a problem, a little bit of small talk. A nice little quote. And again, along the lines of being disruptive, the latest one that I'm, I'm getting quite excited about is uh, Malcolm Gladwell. So, of course, we know him from, uh, you know, he's a bit of the, along the Freakonomics line. A, a great book, by the way. Another great podcast, incidentally, Freakonomics. Your time is valuable. So if you're just sitting around, instead of reading, I don't know, the, the Toronto Star, just plug in and go through revisionist history, for example, from Malcolm Gladwell about the, how does he put it? The uh, unhidden truths and the, the unexpected. So, so what I like about those books, it, it's, it's more about the theme of going, oh, I never really could have seen it that way. I find that for, for nine, you, you hit news.google or Twitter. What I'm really after is concise and unusual, something that I'll, I'll, I'll get some depth, but quickly. So that's why I'm moving more towards podcasts and not necessarily only business books, because business books are good, but related and surrounding business. I could wax lyrical around this around when it comes to machine learning, where you can see that there's a technical angle where we're interested in doing that potentially as a future service, but that's another story. But it's more interesting to see the context around the business incentives. That's great. And obviously, it can innovate podcasts. is another one of the podcasts you're going to be listening to, obviously. <laughs> it's an awesome podcast of yours. But, um. <laughs> uh, shameless plug, shameless plug. But um, so second last question, and I won't take up any more of your time. Is there a favorite Canadian hotspot, hideaway, restaurant, some sort of Canadian delight that you could share with everyone? Okay, so let me go first. Display my inner rockabilly. I love the Cadillac Lounge. Have you ever been there? No, not yet, but uh, okay. it sounds like drinks need to be there. Done and dusted then. It's uh, it's just a phenomenal place. It's got really great talent, local talent. It's uh, it's in Parkdale, so it's a nice, gritty, but not, you know, she-she neighborhood. Yeah, so we'll, that's our, our to-do from this podcast is hit the Cadillac Lounge. <laughs> sounds good. Uh, Jake, do you have a favorite Canadian delight? Yeah, let me let me give a, a shout out to to one of my my, my local favorites around here. It's a, it's a place called Aziza. It's, it's really nice for 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 lunch. A lot of great you know uh, fantastic flavors you know going on there. There's there's a bit of a like North African flair going on, but it's it's a little bit more kind of you know continental in its uh, its experience. But great you know great food, great atmosphere. Uh, I love the the 
you know, the two people that, uh, that, that run that that's for lunch. And then, uh, bar Isabel is, is fantastic. There's, there's a reason that there's uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, top chefs that are now opening restaurants that have bar Isabel on their, on their resume. Uh, that place is, I mean, it's been around for a while, but you know, in Spanish tapas, I mean, you can kind of get that anywhere, but they really do it well. And they really do it. You know, every dish is, is, is top notch. Um, and it's, you know, it's also far and few between that I can recommend octopus at a, at a restaurant because uh, it is so hard to work with, but yeah, the, nail it they, they just they just nail it and it's uh it's fantastic also i mean having a spanish wine list that is literally on on the pages deep makes for a, a lot of fun because I, I find that in, in in toronto especially not a lot of people know know the way through spanish wine so that's that's always fun that's fantastic so last question is how can our listeners connect with you both you can you can find us obviously uh, on the web so elasticthinking.io will kind of give you an overview of our services that we've we've touched on here today give you a little bit more information on you know how we how we think and how we click uh, obviously on, on that page you're gonna find all of our you know juicy contact information so you can t- contact us at uh, email so you know info at elasticthinking.io. You can look up Elastic Thinking on uh, Facebook. You know, we've got Twitter accounts and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, but frankly, just throw Elastic Thinking into Google and you should have yourself sorted out pretty well as well. So feel <laughs> uh, cool free to, to, to email us uh, anytime. So info at ElasticThinking.io. Um, if you have kind of follow-up questions about, uh, you know, any of our comments here, you're, you know, in the market kind of locally and uh, you want to network considering we plug that pretty hard. Um, yeah, by all means. Or you can contact us, obviously, individually. So Jake at ElasticThinking.io or Eve at ElasticThinking.io. That's that's probably the best way to reach us. Excellent. I'll add those to the show notes as well, so people will be, will be at their fingertips. Well, guys, mm-hmm. thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure to spend time with you both, as always. Um, and now I know some other places I need to go t- try out around the city. So, again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I recognize that time is valuable and a precious commodity. So I really want to thank you again for your time and listening and staying with us. Next week, we'll actually be chatting with Ray Kahani and he will be teaching us how he's turned lemons into coffees on me. So don't forget to hit subscribe, leave a review and nominate Canadian Innovator. This is our podcast and I'm looking forward to chatting with you next week. Cheers. Cheers.